No, No Bird Sings by Edward Frederick Benson. Red chimney of a house for which I bound were visible from just outside the station, for which I had lighted. So the chauffeur told me the distance was not more than a mile's walk. We took the path across the fields. We ran straight till it came to the edge of the wood yonder. We belonged to my host. Over that which his chimneys were visible, I would find a gate with a paling of this wood, a thick transversing it, track traversing it, which to put close to the garden. So in its honourable afternoon of early May, it seemed to waste the time to do no other than walk through the meadows and woods I set off to on foot while the motor carried my tracks. It's one of those golden days which every now and then can leak out of paradise and drift to earth. Green had been linked in the coming, but now it's here to reverse. The whole world was boring with the sap of life. Never have I seen a wealth of spring flowers, such vividness of green, heard such mentonian sweetness among the birds and the hedgerows. It's walked through the meadows as a jubilee, a festival ecstasy. A best of all, so I promise myself, when we passes through the wood, newly fledged with milky green, I lay just be ahead. There was a gate just facing me as I passed through it into the draped They pulled the lights, the shadows of grass grown track. Coming under brilliant sunshine was like entering a dim tunnel, while in a sense of being suddenly withdrawn from the brightness that spring into some quaterous cavern. The tree tops formed a green roof overhead, excluding light to a remarkable degree. I moved a world of shifting obscurity. Presently the fit that as the trees grew more scattered, their place was taken by thick growth of hazels which met o- over the path and then the ground sloping downwards I came upon an open clearing covered with bracken and heather and studded with birches but now but through now I walked once more beneath the luminous sky with the sunlight pouring down seeming to have lost its efferage the brightness was it some sort of op- odd optical illusion? Was it was it veiled as if I came through creep? Yet there was a sun, it was still above the treetops of untidied heaven. All that light was of a snowy, stormy winter's day, but the warmth of brilliance is at least silent too. I thought the birds and trees would be ringing the song of mating birds, but listening I can hear no note. Any sort of breather, the fluting of thrash of blackbirds, nor the cheerful swirl of chuffinch, the cooing wood pigeon, nor the strident clamber of the jay, as a pause to, ver- to verify the sort of silence. There was no doubt about it. It's rather eerie, rather uncanny. I suppose the birds knew their business, their business best. If they were too busy to sing, it was their affair. As I went on, it struck me that it also that since entering the wood, I had not seen a bird of any kind. Now, as I crossed the clearing, I kept my eyes alert for them, but fruitlessly. And soon I entered the entire further belt of thick trees which surrounded it. Most of them I noticed were birches growing every close to each other. The ground beneath them was bare, but a carpet of fallen leaves, a thin few thin bramble branches in this curious dimness and thickness of the trees it was possible to see far to right or left the path and now for the first time since I had left the open I heard some sound of life a cane of rustled leaf from not far away I thought to myself oh, that a rabbit somehow was moving but somehow it lacked the stiletto predator of a small animal there's a certain stealthy heaviness about it. Something much larger was stealing along with dim, delirious, 
of being not feverish, of not being heard. I pause again to see what might emerge, but instantly the sound ceased. Simultaneously, as conscious of some faint, the very foul odour reaching me, a small choking, a smell choking, corrupt, yet somehow pungent, more like the odour of something alive than rotting. The peculiar sickening, and not wanting to get any closer, with source, I went on my way. Before long, I came to the edge of the wood. Straight in front of me was a strip of meadow, land, and beyond an iron gate, between two brick walls, through which I had, glimpsed, had a glimpse of lawn of flower beds to the left of the house, and over the house of God, where poured and made in brightness the climbing afternoon. Huge Granger and his wife had been sitting out on the lawn, huge a pack of salted horse dogs, a Welsh collier, a yellow retriever, a fox terrier, Pekingese, a protest at my intrusion, gave way to the welcome recognition I was admitted into the circle. This is much to say, I've been out of England for the last five months, three months, during which time Hugh has settled into this little state left him a close uncle. He and Daisy had been busy during the Easter vacation, getting into the house. Clearly, certainly, the most attractive legacy house, though, which I had presently taken, was the delightful little Queen Anne manor, its situation at the edge of this heather clad Surrey Ridge, quite superb, with tea and small panel parlour overlooking the garden soon the world took it. Narrowed down to those the day and the hour I walked and had I, uh, I asked Davy for the, for the station, did I go for the wood or follow the path outside it? The question she thus put to me was given trivially enough, with no hint of her voice. It mattered two straws for which I had come. But it was quite clearly born in upon me, and only, not only she, but he also listened intently by replying. He lit a match for his cigarette, but held it and replied till he heard my answer. Yes, I come through the wood, but now, though I had received some impressions of the wood, it seemed quite ridiculous to mention what they were. I could not soberly say the sunshine. There was a very poor quality, and at one point my traverse, I smelt of most curious odour. I had walked through the wood. That's all I had to tell them. Had I known both my hosts and hostess for the tale many years now, if I felt there was nothing set purity, fanciful stuff, I could volunteer about my experiences there, I noticed they exchanged a swift glance. I could easily interpret it. Each of them signaled to the other, expression of relief. They told each other, so I extracted a glance. I, at a rate, could find nothing unusual in the wood. They were pleased by that, that. But then, before any real pause had succeeded to my answer, I'd gone through the wood. I remember the stream accents of dog bird song, of birds. I seen it in the credulous observation of natural history. I thought I might as well mention it. One odd straight thing struck me. I began, and instantly I saw the attention of both riveted again. I did not see a single bird of rip here one from the time I entered the wood to when I left it. Hugh lit his cigarette. I noticed that too, he said. It's rather puzzling. The wood is certainly a bit primeval forest. One would have thought the host of birds were nested in it for time immemorial. Memorial. But like you, I never seen, heard or seen one in it. I never seen a rabbit there either. I thought I heard this one, heard one this afternoon, said I. Something was moving the fallen breech leaves. Did you see it? he asked. I collected, I decided the noise was not quite the pat of a rabbit. No, I don't see it, I said. And perhaps it wasn't one. It sounded, I remember, more like something larger. 
Once again, unmistakably, a glance passed between you and his wife, and she rose. I must be off, she said. Post goes out at seven, at least, all morning. What are you two going to do? Something outdoors, please, said I. I want to see the put domain. You and I, Cody strode out of the mountain, the cohort of dogs of the vein was certainly very charming. A small lake lay beyond the garden, where reed bed vocal with warblers, a tufted margin of which coots and hens scurried at your approach at our approach. Rising from the end there was a huge high, heavy knoll, full of rabbit holes, which the dogs nose at with joyful expectations. We sat for a while overlooking the wood, which covered the rest of the state. Even now the blaze of sun to it, near to it setting, as seemed to be in the shadow, through like the rest of the view. It, would have, it should have basked in brilliance, but not a cloud flecked the sky, a very evil rays enveloped the world, crimson splendour, but the wood was grey and darkling. You also, I was aware, had been looking at it, and now, with the air breaking into a disagreeable topic, you turned to me. Tell me, he said, does anything strike you about that wood? Yes, it seems to lie in shadow. He frowned. But it can't, you know, he said. Where does the shadow come from? Not from outside, just for the sky. A land on fire. From the inside, then? I asked. He was silent a moment. There's something queer about it, he said at length. There's something there. I don't know what it is. Daisy feels it too. She won't ever go into wood. It appears the birds won't either. It's just the fact that, some, for some unexplained reason, there are no birds in in it that has set all our imaginations at work I jumped up oh it's all rubbish I said let's go for it now and find a bird I bet you will find a bird sixpence for every bird you see said Hugh we went down the hillside and walked through the wood until we came to the gate where I entered the afternoon, I held it open. I'd done, gone in, the dogs to follow, but they stood a yard or so away. None of them moved. Come on, dogs, I said, and Fifi did what the fox here, took a step nearer, and with a little whine, retreated again. They always do that, said Hugh. Not one of them would set foot inside the wood. Look. He whistled and called, he cajoled, he scolded, but no, it was no use. Dogs remained with little pudded grins and quizzling, signaling the tails, but quite determined not to come. But why, I asked. Same reason as the birds, I suppose, whatever has happened to be. There's Phoebe, for instance, the sweetest tempered little lady. Once I tried to pick her up and carry her in, she snapped at me. They have nothing to do with wood. They trot round outside it and go home. We left them there for the sun, and in the sunlight, set light, which was now beginning to fade again, passes usually the sense of eeriness disappears. One has a companion, but now to me, he was huge, walking by my side. Place seemed more uncanny had done that afternoon a sense of intolerable uneasiness that grew into a sort of waking nightmare assessed me I thought before that the silence and loneliness of what had played tricks my nerves but with Hugh here it could be not be that indeed I felt if it was not any such notion that lay the root of his fear but rather the conviction of some presence lurking there, invisible as yet, but permeating the gathered gloom. I could not have, could not form the slightest ear what it might be, or whether it was material or ghostly. All I could do, all I could do, could, diagnose it from my own sensations, 
that it was evil and antique. He came to the open ground in the middle of the wood. Hugh stopped, and though the evening was cool, noticed that he muffled his forehead. Pretty nasty, nasty, he said. No wonder dogs don't like it. How do you feel about it? Before I could answer, he shot his hand, pointing the, at his hand, pointing to the belt of trees that lay beyond. What's that? he said in a whisper. I followed his finger and once for one second thought I saw against the black the woods a vague figure, grey and faintly luminous. It weighed as if it had been the head of Fourpot, some huge snake rearing itself, but instantly disappeared and my glimpse had been mo- so momentarily I could not trust my impression. It's gone, said Hugh, still looking in the direction he had pointed. He stood there. I heard it again I had heard that afternoon a rustle among the fallen birch leaves with no wind no breath no still brief stir or breath of breath of stir he turned to me what on earth was that was it he said you look like some enormous slug dang up did you see it I'm not sure whether I did or not I said I think I just caught sight of what you saw what was it? He said again. Was it a real material creature or was it something ghostly, do you mean? I asked. Something halfway between the two, he said. I'll take, tell you what I mean afterwards when we get out of this place. The thing, whatever it was, had vanished. Along the trees had left up our path lay in silence we walked across the open till they came to where it en- where it entered tunnel like among the trees faintly I hated and feared the thought of praying it plunging into the darkness the knowledge that not far off there was something in the nature of which I would never see ever so faintly conjecture for which I made no doubt for what was that which filled the wood with some nameless terror was it material was it ghostly or was it and some inkling of what he went beyond the film itself into my hand, mind some being that lay in the borderland between the two all of the sinister possibilities appeared the most of all the sinister possibilities that appeared the most terrifying terrifying as he Entered the trees again, I perceived that a reek, a reek alive yet a corrupt, which I had smelt before, but now it's far more poignant, potent. And we hurried on, choking with the odour. I now guessed we do not, we had not the potency of decay, the living substance of which, of that to which called, and reared itself into the darkness of wood, and a bird with shelter. Somewhere along these trees lurked the reptilian thing to find and yet compelled credit credence. Or oh, it was a blessed relief to get out that dim tunnel, the wholesome air of the open, the clear light of the evening. Vim doors we when we returned windows and curtains and lamps lit up lit. There was a hint of frost and Hugh put on a match to the fire of his room where the dogs still little apologetic held up with thumpings of drowsy tails. And now we got got to talk, said he, and lay our plans out our plans. For whatever it is that is in the wood, we have got to make an end of it. If you want to know what I think it is, I'll tell you. Go ahead, said I. You may laugh at me if you like, said he said, but I believe it's an eternal, ephemeral. That's why I meant what I meant when I said it was half way between a material and ghostly. I never met and caught a glimpse of it to this afternoon. I only felt there was something horrible there. But now I've seen it. It looks like a spiritist, as some of her folk described as an elemental, a huge philosopher's slug. What they 
is what they tell us of it, which will, at which it will, surround itself with darkness. Somehow, now safe of indoors, in cheerful light, a walk for the room, the suggestion appeared merely grotesque. Out there in the darkness of a comfortable wood, something had put me in, within me quite at great I've had to believe any horror but now common sense revolted but you don't mean to tell tell me you believe in such rubbish I said you might as well say it, it was a unicorn what if it if, what is an element to anyway who has ever seen one set of people who listen to rats in the darkness and say they're made by their aunts what is it then he asked I should think it is chiefly your own nerves I said frankly I knowledge I got the creeps when I went through the wood first and I got them much worse when I went through it with you but it was just nerves we were frightening ourselves and each other and are the dogs frightening themselves and each other he said us and the birds that was rather harder to answer in fact I gave up Hugh continued. Well, just for a moment, we suppose that something else, not ourselves, frightened us. The dogs and the birds, he said. And what and what we did see, something like a huge fluorescent slug. I won't call it an elemental. If you if you object to that, I'll call it, I'll call it it. There's another thing, too, which is the existence of it would explain what's that I asked but it's supposed to be some incantation of evil it's corporate form of the devil so I don't need spiritual it's material with this scent been seen boldly in form and heard as you notice smelt and God forbid handled it to be kept alive by management which well, explains possibly why perhaps why every day since I've been here I found a no we went up some to half dozen dead rabbits stoats and weavers Whistle, weasels said I no stoats and weevils stoats kill their prey eat it these rabbits have not been eaten they have been drunk what on earth do you mean I asked I explained several of them I examined several of them there was a small hole in their throats they've been drained of blood just skin and bones sort of grey mash of fibre just like the fibre of an orange that had been sucked also a horrible smell lingered on them it was a thing you had a glimpse like a stout or weasel there came a rattle that handled the door not a word to Daisy said Hugh as she entered I heard you come in she said what where do you go all around the place, said I, and came back for the wood. It's odd. Not a bird did we see. But this is partly accounted for because it's dark. And so I searched Hughes, but no communication there. I guess I played, he played some attack on it. Next day, he did not wish her to know what was it, that anything was afoot. The woods on Poplar, he said. Birds don't go there. Dogs don't go there. Daisy won't go there. I'm bound to say I share the feeling too. By a, having braved its terrors in the dark. A broken spell. All quiet, was it? She asked she. Quiet was it wasn't word for it. The smallest pin could have been heard. Dropping a half a mile off. We talked over our plans that night after he'd gone up to bed. Your story about the suck rabbits with, was rather horrible. Though there's no certain connection between those empty vines and animals, what we've seen, there seemed a certain relatedness about it. Not everything you point out which could feed like that was clearly not within about its maternal side. Ghosts did not have dinner. And it was a bit if it was chill, it was vulnerable. Our plans therefore were very simple. We're going to tramp through the wood. As no one as one walks up past wakes up walks up partridges, the field of turnips. 
each of the shot diamonds and pie cartridges. Not saying that we look forward to the expedition. I hated the thought of getting into those close quarters, those mysterious dead in the woods. There's sudden excitement about it. Significant to keep me awake for a long time a long time. When I got to sleep, of course. Very vivid and awful dreams. The morning failed to fulfil the promise of the clear sunset. The sky was lowering and cloudy, a heavy rain was falling. Daisy's shopping errands we took her into the little town. As soon as she set off we started on our business. The yellow retriever, mad with joy, the sight of the guns came bounding us across the garden, but on our entering the wood we slunk back home again. The world was roughly circled in shape and diameter, perhaps a mile after a mile. The sense of the I had said there was an open clearing with a quarter of a mile across, which is us surrounded by a belt of thick trees and cooks a couple of hundred yards in breadth. Our plan was first to walk together up the path which led through the wood, with all the possible self, hoping to hear some movement apart from what we had come to seek. Failing that we were settled to tramp through the wood distance of some fifty yards from each other in a circular track. Two or three of these circuits were covered in the whole ground pretty thoroughly. Over the nature of our quarry, whether it would try to steal away from us, possible or possible attack, we had no idea. We seen her yesterday, we have avo- to have avoided us. <laughs> the rain had been falling steadily for an hour. We entered the wood. It hissed a little. Tree tops overhead. And so thick was, was the cover. The ground below was not more, still not more than damp. It was dark morning outside. Have you here? You would, would say the sun already set. Night was falling. Very quietly, we moved up on the grassy path where our footballs were noiselessly. Where our footfalls were noiseless. Once we caught the whiff of the odour of live corruption, though we stayed and listened for not a sound, everything stirred except the solar rain over our heads. We went across this clearing, through to the far gate. Still, there's no sign. We're getting into the trees then, said Hugh. We'd better start where we where we got the whiff of it. We went back to a place which was towards the middle of the encompassing trees. The odour still lingered on the windless air. Go on about fifty yards, he said. Then we'll go in. If it enter, either of us comes on a track of it, we shout to each other. I walked down the path till I gone the right distance. Signal to him. We stepped in among the trees. I had known it. I had never known a sensation of such loneliness. I knew that he was walking parallel with me. Only fifty yards away, I hung on my step. I could faintly hear his tread among the beech leaves. I felt as though quite soldered in this dim from oh companionship and man. The only life thing that lurked here was a monstrous and mysterious creature of evil was so thick with trees I could not see more than a dozen yards in any direction. All places outside the world seemed indifferent, infinitely well remote, infinitely remote. Almost everything had occurred to me in normal human life. I had been whisked out of the wholesome experience into this antique and evil place. The rain had ceased, it whispered to so long, no longer in treetops, testifying they did exist the world and sky over outside. Only a few drops from above patterned on the beech leaves. <sighs> Suddenly I heard a report of whose gun followed by his shouting voice. I missed it, he shouted. It's coming in your direction. I heard him running towards me, the beach sheets rustling, and no doubt his footsteps drowned the stealthy noise that was close to me. All that happened now, till once more, I heard the report of a huge gun 
happened, I suppose, in less than a minute. It would take him much longer. I do, did not imagine I should be telling it today. I stood there. Then, having heard Harold Hughes shout, my gun cocked, ready to put on my shoulder and listen to his running footsteps, I still saw nothing to shoot at and heard nothing. Now, between two birch trees, quite close to me, I saw what I can only describe as a ball of darkness. It rolled every swift, very, very swiftly towards me, over a hundred yard, over the few yards that separated me from it. And then, too late, I heard the dead birch trees rustling below. It just before it reached me, my brain realized it was what it was or what it might be. But before I could raise my gun to shoot at that nothingness, it was upon me. My gun was twitched out of my hand. I was enveloped into this darkness, blackness. I was the very essence of corruption. I knocked them off my feet and sprawled flat on my back. Upon me, as I lay there, I felt the weight of this invisible assailant. I groped wildly in my hands and clutched something cold and slimy and hairy. I slipped off it. Next moment there was a laid across my shoulder. Next something which felt like an uh, Indian rubber tire tube. The end of it fastened on me. My neck like a snake. I felt the skin rise up beneath it. Again with clutching hands I tried to tear that obscure strength away from me. As I struggled with it I heard huge footsteps close to me. Uh, for his layer, for his layer of darkness that lay, that had everything. My mouth was free, I shouted at him. Come here, I yelled, come close to you. Where is it? It is the darkest. Here, here, I yelled, close to you. Where is the darkest? I felt my hands on mine, and it added strength to attach on my neck and sucker. I pulled at it. A core lay heavy on my legs, my chest withered and struggled and relaxed. Whatever it was, had four, or four hands held, slap, slipped out of them. I saw a huge closing, standing close to me, a yard or two off, vanishing among the beech trunks. That was that, was that blackness which had poured over me. Hugh put on his gun, or his second barrel, put up his gun, a sec, with his second barrel fired at it. A blackness of purse. There's a wiggling and twisting like a huge worm. Lay, what, 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 what you come to find? It was alive still, and I picked up the gun while it still lay my side and fired two more barrels into it. A withering dwindled until mere shudderings and shakings, and then it lay still. With huge help, I got to my feet, and we both reloaded before getting nearer. The ground there lay a monstrous thing, half slug, half worm. No head on it, ended a blunt point of an orifice. It was coloured with grey, covered with sparse black hairs, broadest part of what that of a man's thigh, tapering towards the each end, shattered by shot in the middle. There's two that there, the stray pallets, which had hit the elsewhere, and from the holes that made them ooze, but not blood, but some grave, ferocious man, matter. We stood there, some for there, some swift process, disintegration, decay began. It lost on line, outline. It melted, it dignified. A minute more, we were looking at a mass of strange and collagated branch leaves. Again, and quickly, the liqueur of corruption faded. Then lay at our feet no trace of what had been there. Overpowering odour passed away. There came the ground, just a sweet saviour, wet earth in springtime. From above, the glint of sunbeam played in the grounds. There was a sudden pattering among the dead leaves. Left my heart in my mouth again. I caught my gun, but it was only Hughes Yellow Retriever who had joined us. He looked he looked at each other. Are you hurt? Not hurt, he said. I held my chin up. Not a bit, I said. The skin's not broken, is it? No, only around neck big neck. No, only around only around Mark. My God, what was it? What happened? Your turn first, said I. 
beginning, beginning of the bottom. I came upon the, it quite suddenly, he said. It was lying in cold like a sleepy dog behind a big birch. But I could find a slivered off in the direction. I knew where you were. I got a snapshot among the trees. But I must have missed it. For I heard a r- rustling way. I shouted you, ran after it. There was a circle of absolute darkness on the ground. Your voice came from the middle of it. I just s- couldn't see you at all, but I touched at a blank da- da- blackness. My hands met yours, and, and they met something else too. We got back to the house and I had put the guns away before Daisy came home from her shopping. We also scrubbed and brushed and washed. He came into the smoking room. You lazy folk, said she, she said. It, has, it was cleared up. And why are you still up the stairs, indoors? Let's go out at once. I got up. You, you told me, told me you've got a dislike of the wood, I said. And it's a lovely wound, mud, wind, mud. Come and see. He will walk on every, each side of you. Hold your hands. The dogs shall protect you as well. But no one, not one of them, will go a yard within into the woods," said the she. "Oh, yes, he will. At least like we're trying them. We must promise to come if we do." They were whistling them upon them, and down we went to the gate. We sat panting for it to be opened, scurried in the thickets in the pursuit of men dressed in smells. Oh, well, who says there are no birds in the mix? said Daisy. Look at that robin. Why, there are two of them. Evidently, how's something? 